Jody, would you like to introduce the panel? Sure. Um, this is Jerry Bergen. He is from the city of Bellbrook, okay. and he is a service woman. Okay. okay, very good. And I'm Jody Martin, and I'm from MVCC. Okay. I'm Jay Weiskircher. I'm the executive director here at the Miami Valley Communications Council. My previous life, I spent 35 years as the assistant city manager for the city of Oakland. I appreciate you taking time because I know it's busy, but this transitioning in from a peer to supervisor, from personally going through it, I find it a topic that is important. And um, it's always nice to hear from people who are in the same organization as you share, share their thoughts. So, Jay, when you first got into supervision, why did you want to do it? Why did you want to do That's a very good question. <laughs> When I started at Oakwood, I, I started as the administrative assistant, so I really didn't have any supervisory responsibilities. So as I kind of worked my way up the organization, I had more and more people start to, to work under me. In most cases, I was uh, younger than those folks, and um, that's a challenge I think that many people face is supervising people who are uh, maybe older, have more experience than, than you do. So that's certainly an obstacle that, uh, that you have to uh, overcome. Same question. I'm going to ask all three of you this question. Sure. Well, I told you my life before here was Dayton Public Schools, so I'm going to sort of use that experience. Um, I started as a classroom teacher, and I was in the classroom for probably five years, and I had my administrator came to me and they were doing a cohort for aspiring principals. And all my life, I just wanted to be a teacher. And I said, oh, Mrs. Buxton, like, you know, I'm just, that's not for me. And she said, no, you're going to do this. So I feel like I was almost pushed into a role that I just never anticipated doing. Um, and just from there, just doors opened and many opportunities came from that. But that's sort of how my supervisor experience started. And I was definitely peer to supervisor because I worked with all of those people. And I started from ground floor up. When I started with City of Belbrook, there was five employees in the service and water department. And over the years, we've gone up to eight. And I am the oldest employee there now. And um, what I can teach my employees and the information I can give them, they respect and appreciate and they're always coming to me asking me what about this what about that and I don't have to go look it up in a book or find a map and they truly respect that due to the fact that they always say when you're gone and and I, I used to say the same thing when your older peers leave you better know something about what you're doing or you're going to be spending a lot more time than you have to right. the transfer of knowledge yes that's the other thing to keep in mind, right? Um, another question we have for you. So you've transitioned, you, you were a supervisor, you've, you've gone up the ladder here. What are some of the challenges you faced transitioning, going back to that initial transitioning, or in the middle of your development career, you might have trans, transitioning isn't always just once. You transitioned into other um, jobs. Um, so what were some of the biggest uh, challenges you faced um, during transitioning from a peer to a supervisor? When I was at Oakwood, I did uh, the human resources work. So over the years, gave a lot of promotional tests, and that's for people who were in the fire service, police service, uh, public works people, people who worked in the office. Um, and I think the most difficult thing for people is one day just being kind of one of the, the guys or the gals and then the next day you're a supervisor and uh, that's a very difficult transition some people handle it okay other people not so well um, you know it takes a special person because all of a sudden you know the group you used to eat lunch with or whatever they may view you a little bit differently than they they did before you used to be one of them now you're you're one of those supervisory people. And so that's a big adjustment for some people. Um, some people don't handle that well, so that's something that you really need to anticipate, uh, that you're gonna be treated differently or looked at differently by some of your peers. 
not everyone, but, but some people do. So you need to prepare yourself for that. You can still be your friend, but you're, you're now a supervisor, and that friendship is maybe a little bit different than it was before. So, you know, just, just be prepared for, for those kinds of things. I always thought that we didn't do enough of this type of stuff, send people out and just say what you're experiencing and what you're going through is, is typical, it's to be expected, and here are maybe some advice or tips on how best to handle it because it's a difficult transition, especially in smaller organizations. Absolutely. We just spent time talking about that. So I appreciate hearing from you that you've experienced it too. It, it, it is real and it occurs. So. Absolutely. And, and some people I've even seen, they, they drop, they would even drop out of the promotional process because the more they thought about that, they, they couldn't resign themselves to the fact that some of their relationships with their work colleagues were, were going to change if they were successful and ended up being uh, promoted. So it, it's, it's hard for people. Um, do you want to tackle that, Jody? Sure. Okay. Um, from my experience is um, implementing change. And when I first um, started moving up, I was young. And I was with a very veteran staff. And, you know, I would show up at their classroom door or just professional development. And they're looking at me like, what can she tell me? I've already done all of this. Um, so that was very challenging, um, and it was very intimidating. But I remember um, my supervisor saying, uh, start small, build your bandwagon, get a few on your team, because success breeds success, and when they see others doing well, they're going to join your bandwagon. And that's sort of how I tackled that obstacle. Um, but it was very, it was very intimidating, um, very much so. And I also felt the same way with the upper management part of it. The bottom, bottom peers I could get along with. I was there. We have a great relationship then, and we still do. But it's learning the upper end, the do's and don'ts and the rights and wrongs. While transitioning, while through this whole peer transition thing, can you give an example? Can you think of an example of how you would have handled a situation? What was the situation? And how would you have handled it differently? Taking the supervisor role, it's um, being out in the field with contractors and having to answer questions on the spot on changes that happen at that time. You better know what you're talking about when you make that call and make sure that if you don't, you get the right answers before so you don't make yourself or the city look bad. Okay. So do your homework. Make yes. sure you know what you're talking know about. Know the facts. Because you're right. At the end of the day, you're representing the city. and. Um, you, you, yeah, you're right. You are putting them in the best light. So. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Okay, Jody. Um, looking back now, I think, um, you know, I had people above me telling me, like, this needs to happen by this date, and it, it was almost like they didn't care how the information got out there, but this is what needs to be implemented. But looking back, I had moved from, you know, one building to another, and it was a seasoned staff, and I was young. Um, so maybe just knowing your who mm -hmm. and taking the time to get to know them more individually than just as this was their job title or this was their role, um, maybe having a more of an open mind, um, just really building those relationships and um, having that conversation. Because as I, I was trying to listen to some of you and things that you were um, saying out earlier in here, um, relationships are number one. And once you can get past that, um, makes things a lot easier. Right. So when I look back, I think I would have probably done that differently, the way I approached it. Okay, yeah. And some of that learning just comes from experience. It yeah. does, but it would have been nice to hear it. It would have nice to have gotten a heads up ahead <laughs> of time, yeah. We've talked about the relationship piece. We've talked about knowing who your stakeholders are and things like yeah. that. So. All right, Jay? I think Jody would probably attest to the fact that I'm all about communication and giving people information that, that I feel that it is valuable to them or, or that they need in order to accomplish certain goals. 
So, I mean, what I would suggest to you, and maybe one of the um, mistakes that we all make is that, you know, if you're going to be making changes within an organization or you're going to be making decisions that are going to impact, you know, people's work situation, um, make sure you take the time to prep them for that. I mean, go, go through the process of, of educating people and laying out the rationale as to why, you know, you may want to do things differently than maybe they've been, been done before. I think most people will be very supportive of you as long as you communicate with them and give them the background information as to why you're going in that direction. Also provides you an opportunity to solicit their input and feedback. Um, no one likes just, you know, this is a edict. You're going to do this or we're going to do it this way or that way. No, nobody likes that. Everybody would prefer if you, they were given the background and saying, you know, this is the, the rationale, this is the reason that we're going to do it differently than the way we, we used to. So, you know, take some, take some time and, and, and lay the foundation, lay the groundwork to, to do those kinds of things, especially if you're going to make some, some changes as to procedures or, or how things are, are done differently in your and you're part of the organization. Yeah, even though you've implemented your change, if someone feels that there's something better, always listen to them, because you may make another change to that. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Kind of wearing my messy chart that I was told looked like nacho chips. Um, <laughs> it, um, it's just talking about listening to your employees, you know, and it, it's key, getting their ideas. And when you can, do one of them, it may be not what you originally thought, but they may have a better idea. They've been actually the ones doing the job, whatever. And um, we talked about knowing your stakeholders, and you also talked about you know just the commu you know, just the communication, letting people know what you're thinking and 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 how you're going to go about things, and getting their feedback on it is huge. And I think I had shared with you uh, during my experience of transitioning, having meetings, sharing with people, and and just getting feedback, and that's. It's, it's critical. Also, I also thought of while you were talking is that we mentioned this a little this day, managing up, managing up. So if I am going to make changes, I have ideas I want to do, including my supervisor <laughs> into that, what I'm thinking, and um, is, is always another helpful thing. When I was on campus and transitioned into my department, my supervisor on campus took time to take me to um, meetings with him. He was probably like the third guy on campus at that time under the, pro, under the provost, taking me to uh, meetings, introducing me to people that I would need to work with directly, and um, I, making sure that I knew who the president was and, and could have conversations with him and get on the schedule if I needed it. And that was super helpful. It, it made me feel more confident too. So it, that, that may not always apply in all your situations, but Again, that communication piece is just cute. All right, I got another question for you. So, you've transitioned and we've talked about some of the challenges, but not everything is challenging. So what are some of the positive factors of becoming the supervisor of former peers? Anybody can? I think the easiest thing is that you, you've already done it. I mean, you're not gonna ask anybody to do something that you probably haven't already done. And so you can certainly use that to, to your advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people respect that too. You know, that's, that's obviously gonna be a positive in your direction. And I would, you know, to the extent that you can continue to do some of those things, you know, if, if it's in the public works department and you got people in a hole and that's what you used to do, jump in the hole from time to time. Exactly. Or if you're fixing potholes, do that. Or if you're working on Excel spreadsheets, I mean, help people do that. Um, e even though you're a supervisor now, that doesn't mean that from time to time you can't get down there and show people, hey, I remember what it was like, you know, I've done this before, and I'm here to help you. So, you know, use that to, uh, to your advantage. By doing that, you're showing them you're still at the same level with them. You're not above them or below them. Right. And they, they appreciate that. They do appreciate that. Uh, you can, don't even imagine how much they appreciate yes. that. Um, sometimes in training when I hear people talk about their supervisor, they go, hey, we had this is issue down the line or wherever, and my supervisor got right in there and helped. So that, that's key. 
and the other thing I would, would also add is let, let people know that you're, you're advocating for them. Because I'm, I'm sure, you know, there were times that you'd sit around and talk with your, your co-workers about what the problems were with management or how they did certain things. I mean, now that you're in a position to maybe try and influence that, let people know that, that you are trying to do that. And also let them know that sometimes change takes time and it's not going to happen overnight, but just make sure that they know that you're being an advocate for them. That doesn't mean that you can guarantee that things are going to change. But let people know that, you know, you haven't forgotten those discussions that, that we used to have. And that people should feel free to come to you when they have problems, when they have circumstances, when they have situations that, uh, that you can ho possibly help them with. That builds a good trust. The number one thing that employees want out of their management, the characteristic is trust. They, they want to be able to trust you. And that's one way to build it, too. I was just going to say um, one of the positive factors is you know and remember what it was like to always be on that side. Mm -hmm. So when you are supervising them and you have to make a decision or something occurs, just remember how they're going to feel or because you were there. Um, I'm obviously using my experience as classroom teacher, administrator, but I just say like teachers are in the trenches every single day. Same with probably like our police officers, you're out in the streets, like you're in the work. So when you start moving up and you might not be in that work every day dealing with like that clientele or people, just remember what it was like when you were there anytime you need to make a decision. Because I mean, you think you don't get removed from it, but sometimes you do because society changes. Um, I started in the late 90s and did it, the work for a little over 21 years. Society has changed, so the longer you're pulled away from that work, just remember what it was like. I want to know what your biggest learning has been. What advice would you give to someone who is supervising former peers or just going into leadership in general? What's your biggest learning? What advice? Patience. Patience. Patience, patience, patience. Okay. You can explain something to somebody and they say they understand it and they totally didn't <laughs> get it. And then they go out to do the job and you have to go out and correct them. And you just got to train. Patience and training. Right. And once they do it repetitiously enough, um, hopefully they'll get it. They'll get it. Okay. So definitely having patience. Yes. In, in training. Um, I think it was at this table we were talking about um, sometimes you'll train and you, and you think everybody has it. And maybe at that moment they know they don't, but everybody else looks like they have it. So they don't want to be the one that says, excuse me, I don't get it. So then they'll go out and not do it correctly until you realize it's a training issue and we have to go back. So yeah, definitely. So I'm going to say what Jerry said, patience. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just the type of person that I just want it done and I know that I'm going to just get it done. And so letting go of that and maybe like delegating that out a little bit. Um, it's funny that Jerry just said that because I just have to share this. He worked for my dad when I was a little girl. So we were both kind of trained by the same person okay. and he had zero patience. So the fact that we're both like piggybacking on that, that might be because that's who trained us. But if I have like X, Y, and Z and I have somebody under me and I'm expecting them to do it, like I just want it done. And so for me to step back and let that happen was probably difficult. Um, so yeah, just the patience of it. And also know that just because you tell somebody what needs to be done or you explain to them, you don't know how they perceive that. And then how are they actually going to apply that when they're doing it? It's probably going to look different than what you might think. Mm -hmm. So you just have to take those learning styles and how people actually work in their ethic of producing it or getting it done. So it goes back to patience. Um, I, guess, I guess I would suggest to you, as difficult as this is, try and be positive and, and, and upbeat because people pick up on, on that. I mean, if you're always down in the dumps or every day it seems like it's, wor 
you know, it's actually worked for you to, to come to work and to supervise people. Um, people pick up on that, and that's how they're going to approach their jobs, too. So I realize no matter what you do in an organization, it can be routine, mundane, boring. Things can happen that tick you off and everything. But to the extent that you can be positive, you can pick people's spirits up, um, you know, you, you can make work interesting, you can sometimes make it fun. I mean, try to do those kinds of things. Um, you know, make sure that, you, you know, you recognize employees. Here's, here's maybe the best advice I could ever give, give someone. If you're going to be critical of people, that's fine, but make sure that when they do a good job that you praise them too, because they're not going to respect you if all you ever do is yell at them or, or they're in trouble for something. So if, if you're willing to hold them accountable, then praise them when they do something. And that means, you know, take the time to write them an attaboy or an girl note that goes in their personnel file. You'd be surprised how important that is to, to some people. And, you know, different people have different buttons. So the button you push for this person may be a different button than that person. So you need to know who, who you're dealing with. And you have to treat, you'll hear people say this, don't treat employees differently. Well, you have to treat employees differently because they're all different. What motivates employee A may not motivate employee B. So, you know, treat people as individuals. Get a handle on what their hot buttons are, what you can do to, to encourage them along, what are some of the things that you, you don't want to say to them. So get to know your people both, you know, work-wise, you know, ask about their families and stuff. That's important to people. And, and you don't have to get into their business or anything else, but, you know, a lot of people pick up on that too. Yeah, you don't care about me, you don't care about my family, you never ask about my family, my kids, this, that, or the other. I mean, to the extent that somebody will, you know, converse with you about that, talk to them about those things. Some people are very private. They don't want you to know their business. But other people, just, just let them know that they're human beings. They're, they're something other than just being there to get a task accomplished. Great. It's perfect advice. And it truly is important and it truly works. Um, just getting involved in understanding the people. I had a, a supervisor once at the university who said, I may have the most horrible night before I come to work, but you will never know it. And honestly, you never did. If he was having a bad day or something went wrong, he didn't bring that into work with him. Sometimes he may share one-on-one -on -one with someone, but you did not see a, a bad mood or negative vibes coming, coming out of that person, so. Your supervisor makes a decision that you have to relay to your staff mm -hmm. and they give you a big pushback. How do you deal with that? Because I, it's not going to change. You're going to do it this way, <laughs> whether they like it or not, but they're pushing back mm -hmm. really hard. You just got to tell them, look, we've got to get this done and this is the way they want it done and there's no ifs, ands, buts about it. I'm sorry, I can't change it for you. Um, Let's all man up here and just get it done and get on to the next job. Um, my old famous line was always, don't kill the messenger. <laughs> and sometimes before the information was given out, like I said, I kind of created a bandwagon of a few. So I had that support when the message was actually being delivered. Um, sometimes too, if you have some data or information or research or facts of why this is happening, people will buy into that a little bit. But that is a tough situation. But just don't kill the messenger. That was my famous line. You know, I, I guess try not to throw people under the truck. I mean, if, if you're, if that came from a supervisor, and maybe you don't necessarily agree with the decision either. I mean, that happens a lot too. Mm -hmm. um, but don't throw people un, under the bus. I mean, you got to communicate that. You, you're wearing your big boy pants now because you're a supervisor. I mean, you got to communicate that to people. There's nothing wrong with empathizing with people. And, and like Jody just said, maybe explain to them some of the uh, thought processes that, that went into that. They still may not buy into that, but I guess the bottom line is, you know, we're going to try it this way for a while. If there are ways that we can improve upon it, you know, we're, we're open to that, but, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to, have to bite the bullet, but 
you know like i say don't throw people under the bus that that you don't get any credit for that and that's going to come back to by torture so i just want to what jay is saying um i um i started out you know young but but as i cycle through my very first supervisor and i 18 years later ended up in cubicles right next to each other and so just don't ever burn bridges even if you don't care for that person um, always try to reflect back of why they're behaving or why they're acting some way but don't burn bridges you never know when that person is going to be your equal or you might be above them or because life happens and I I just my whole career did a 360 I mean she and I were right next to each other and then right before I came here my paraprofessional aide was a former student of mine and we worked together every single day so you just never know where you're going to end up or who's going to be right next to your side so as hard as that is sometimes you gotta like jerry said be an adult man up but don't burn bridges i let me just add and, and i think i just touched upon this i think the hardest thing to do is to communicate to somebody um, information or a policy or whatever that you don't necessarily buy in with I mean that is very very difficult and that is a real challenge and all of you are gonna face that at some point in time in your career and and how you handle that is kind of a measure of whether or not you're gonna be successful or not so you know that's a challenge that everybody has to has to deal with and all you can do is, you know, hopefully you have input into why that decision was made and, and you put, put forth your arguments. But, you know, if the ultimate decision is not really in the direction you would like it to go, it's still your obligation to communicate it down and say, hey, this is how we're going to do it and we all need to buy into this. And something to add into that, Jay, is a lot of times your boss may come to you and not have time to tell you the whole story at that time. He just wants you to do this part of the job. There may be something lurking down the road that's going to change, or and he doesn't have time to explain it to you, or they haven't come up with the final solution. So really, it's a lot of times when they say, you know, this is what we got to do, and it's not making sense, you just go out and do what they ask. In the past, you know, you've been in one organization, it was the norm to be in one organization for 30 or 40 years and spend your whole career there. And kind of the new norm, especially like she was talking about earlier, they push in universities, yes. you know, you kind of, you're in one place for five years and then it's kind of the norm to switch to something else. Maybe it's the same role, mm -hmm. maybe you take a supervisor role at a different organization, but, you know, do you think it changes the advice of, of, of the relationships that you build being in one organization for a long time versus trying to move organizations every couple of years. Well, I'm going to say if you leave an organization and you go to a new place and you step into that supervisor leadership role, you're already going to be looked at differently anyways because you were never their equal or their peer. But I just think that if that happens, you want to know your who. You want to know who is under you, what their strengths are, um, how they're going to perceive your communication because if they weren't your former peer you're not going to know anything about them so you need to take the time to learn that because it is about the rapport and getting to know I just always um, you have to lead by example and it, I think we all said it in here earlier don't expect them to do anything that you wouldn't do but I, I, I think it's almost to an advantage sometimes for them not to know you but there's positives to also move up as well but I think you're looked at a little bit differently entering that position. Yeah. I would add one more thing. Do you feel cautious when you go to an organization? You don't trash the one you came from? Yes. yes. Because kind of like yes. what Jody said, it is, you'd be surprised how small of a network mm -hmm. it is. Down the road, something may happen, and that may keep you. They might be like, you know, they left here and badmouthed us, so why do we exactly so even if you didn't agree or you left on bad terms, yep. think of yourself down the right. road long term. Right. Don't badmouth everybody. Absolutely not. Because right. especially what I'm learning coming from education to even here, everybody knows everybody. Yeah. Um, especially when it's like the local government, this person was in this city, now they're mm -hmm. in this city. It was the same when I was um, in education. This principal is now a principal in this district. 
So there's some connection. So just even, so, I tell my kids this, just because you think it doesn't mean it needs to come out of your mouth. Like, you can think whatever you want, just don't let it out. Yes. I think being a supervisor is all about building relationships. And I think, you know, people who are in an organization for three or four years and then they move on and then they move on to somewhere else, I mean, I, I think you lose some of that ability there. Um, I mean, that, that's just my opinion. I, I came from a generation where, where people, they started working somewhere and that's, you know, if they liked it, that's where they finished their career. I realize things are, are, are different now that people do move around, but uh, like I say, I think being a supervisor is all about building relationships and, uh, you know, in a lot of cases that takes time. The other thing I, I would also mention to you is, you know, be an advocate for your employees. If they have good ideas or, you know, a different way to do stuff, I mean, listen to them and if you feel that it has credibility and, and you need to take it to the next level, I mean, do that for them. Um, that, that may not necessarily mean that things are going to change or somebody is going to accept it, but again, be an advocate for them. By the same token, um, you know, if somebody comes up with an idea that's probably not the best idea or, or whatever, I mean, tell people that. I mean, be, on, be honest with people. Don't tell somebody they have a good idea when you, when you don't think that the idea is a good idea. Um, you know, ju just treat people, you know, practice the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And that's what I used to tell the supervisors who I kind of had some con control of. I mean, treat people the way you want to be treated. It's not always easy to do that. And you're always going to have favorite employees, but, you know, as you look at the, a group of people, just try to treat them the way you want to be treated, and I think you'll be successful as a supervisor. Yes. And the other thing is, like Jay was saying, know your employees, utilize those guys the best you can, and mix your groups up. Don't just put A with A every day, B with B. Mix those guys up, let them intermingle, let them train them on different things, give them the lead, let them go out and do their thing. If they're doing something wrong, correct that person, or as a group, explain to them what they're doing wrong, but let them go at it, let them, they feel better doing the job and knowing that they're doing it right. Thank you so much Thanks for coming everybody. and your Good time. Luck. and. Uh, <laughs> We appreciate you sharing uh, from your experience, and uh, it always makes me feel good because it kind of validated some of the things we already talked about. So uh, anyway, thank you very much.